Okay. The next session is very critical to everyone in the room. Probably one of the more practical applications we're going to have. As some of you are aware, um, in India, ISKCON is building a temple um, um, at, at uh, Vedic Planetarium. Temple Vedic Planetarium. It is a huge tens of millions of dollar project. In it, there will be many exhibits. We have uh, Robert Grant and Michael Cremo, Rameshwar Prabhu and Druta Karma Prabhu here to talk about two things. That project and the tremendous opportunity for many of you to engage in doing something that will have an impact for millennium. It's a rare, rare opportunity to get engaged. Without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to uh, Druta Karman Rameshwar Prabhu. Thank you. I'm here to introduce the Temple of Vedic Planetarium to you at this convention, this conference. I want to dispel a, uh, a common misunderstanding. Many of you who, are, um, have, who have been following the historic development of this $100 million project have been told that the exhibits are going to pattern <clears throat> the story of Gopakumar traveling through the universe as described in the Brihat Bhagavatamrita of Srila Sanatan Goswami. So there are two distinct sections of exhibits being planned. The temple itself has three domes, as you may know. The central dome is the main temple in Kirtan Hall, where the 200-foot tall chandelier of the universe will be suspended from the top of the dome. That's 20 stories. And this is a huge model of the universe. To the, as you enter, to the right is a, is a dome where other deities will be for Lord Nishringadev. But once you get above the Kirtan Hall, the exhibit space for the main central dome and the area where Lord Nishringadev is are all one, winding floor by floor exhibition. That is where, where excuse me, with beautiful dioramas, the story of creation and then the story of uh, Gopal Kumar traveling through the universe will be told. Now, in the other dome, which is the Planetarium Museum, the Science Museum, the top of that dome is a dome planetarium theater. There's an entry level and three floors above the entry level before you get to the planetarium theater. On those four levels, entry and levels one, two, and three above, will be the science exhibits that explain what we're going to tell you, or what Drew is going to show you, and Michael Cremo is going to show you today. So we're not here to discuss the story of Gopal Kumar and those diorama exhibits. We are here to discuss how to present and explain what Prabhupada wanted in this temple of Vedic planetarium. And I'll be interjecting every now and then very limitedly, but I want to say that we have a great need, we being the devotees who are on a committee who are planning the exhibits, have a great need for 
the best minds amongst our devotee philosophers and amongst our science-minded devotees to be advisors to this group that's planning these exhibits. We can't afford to present something that could easily be scoffed at. We really need the help of our best philosophers and our best science-minded devotees. And we'll explain that as we go along. Thank you. So this is going to be a very provisional sketch, not etched in stone. Uh, we're in the process of initial conceptual development, and I just want to sketch out today you know, the basic narrative flow that we have in mind and give you an idea about some of the topics that are going to be displayed. And as Robert Grant and Rameshwar Prabhu said, we're going to be soliciting your help and advice. <clears throat> so this is the Temple of Vedic Planetarium as it will as it will look when it's completed in Mayapur, West Bengal. And I'd like you to all imagine that someone you love has forgotten who he is, where he is. That would be a very sad situation. But actually, we're all in that position. We do not know the real answers to the questions, who am I? and where am I? <clears throat> so the Temple of Vedic Planetarium exists to give answers to those fundamental questions. And the answers will come from the school of Vedic thought represented by His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. The answers to these questions may be different in some cases from those given by many scientists today. And why is that? The Vedic system of thought relies on sources of knowledge beyond those recognized by modern science today. According to the Vedic system of thought, there are three sources of knowledge, or pramanas. The first two are pratyaksha pramana, evidence from sense perception, and the anumana pramana, evidence from logical inference. Modern science is based today on pratyaksha and anumana sense evidence and logical inference. We're going to have some exhibits that show the limits of pratyaksha and anumana. And we're also going to introduce a third source of knowledge, the third pramana, the shabda pramana, evidence from transcendental sound which is recorded in the Vedic literature, the Puranas, so forth. Followers of the Vedic system of thought sometimes will use sense evidence and logical inference in the service of establishing the con conclusions uh, that come from the Shabda Pramana. So it's not that those sources of knowledge are going to be completely ignored. <clears throat> so our first question is, who am I? Today, many scientists will say we're simply machines made of molecules. They would say that life comes exclusively from chemicals, but as we've heard many times throughout this gathering, uh, this really hasn't been established. 
in a truly scientific way. Many scientists believe that the first single-celled organism evolved through evolution by natural selection into all the complex forms of plants and animals we see around us today. But no scientist has really explained how this has exactly happened by unguided genetic changes. Some scientists see evidence for purposeful manifestation in the biological complexity of organisms. Valade Vidya Bhushana, in the Vedic tradition, said in his commentary to the Vedanta Sutra, seeing the wonderful arrangement and management of the cosmic manifestation generally suggests a living brain is behind this arrangement, for without a living brain, such an arrangement could not exist. That's from Srila Prabhupada's translation of the Chaitanya Charitamrita. The evidence for purposeful manifestation is thus consistent with the Shabda Pramana. Judah, let me just jump in for one second. Yes. So the Temple of Vedic Planetarium is going to address a, the, a number of questions that have been the questions of life as long as human life has existed. What is the origin of consciousness? What is the origin of the different species? What's the origin of the first life? And what is the origin of the entire universe and its planetary systems and so on? So when we call for help and advisors, it's because in order to present the Vedic concepts in cosmology and origins of life and so on, what we need to do is recognize that many people throughout the whole world have been trained, educated, even persuaded to think of these questions as already having been answered in a certain mechanistic model. What we want to do in some of these exhibits is find the best way to present certain issues that would perhaps cause some doubt instead of thinking of them as already proven truths or facts by creating some doubt and still therefore showing that they're just theories, in fact theories that are undergoing changes all the time, it could leave a person open-minded enough to consider the Vedic model. That's our approach. We're, gonna, we're not just going to thrust the Vedic model on them in an assertive, dogmatic way. Step by step, we have to take a person through a journey. By the time we get to cosmology, hopefully we will have succeeded in opening their eyes and mind to the possibility of other concepts for the origin of life and the universe. And it's in this area that we need help from our best philosophers and scientists. We have very specific, I'll just give you one example and then. In discussing the mechanistic theory of evolution, there might be 10 or 15 great controversies that haven't been explained by that theory. We'd like to have the top two <laughs> that haven't been defeated or challenged yet and make those exhibits that may change over time as they keep coming up with other theories. We'll keep adding the th exhibits that will create doubts. So it's in this area that we need trained specialists. And just one other thing, it's not just attacking modern world views. We also plan on having exhibits that show some of the similarities, the astonishing similarities between Vedic knowledge that is thousands and thousands of years old and the most recent modern thoughts. Even evolution, which is only 200, 250 years old in the modern world, 
We have a whole explanation of evolution in the Vedas. That's astonishing if it's presented the right way. To astonish someone that there's, there are texts that describe evolution that are thousands of years old. There are texts that describe what's similar to the modern cosmic inflation theory of the universe that are thousands of years old. So we're not just attacking modern science, we're also f showing how what modern science has uncovered has already been presented in a much clearer way in the Vedas. So it's going to be very interesting if that's presented in the right way. So getting to the topic of this conference today, uh, you know, many scientists, as we've heard, believe consciousness is produced by molecules in the brain, but uh, they've never shown exactly how in a way that's acceptable to uh, a broad consensus, even within the scientific world today. However, there is evidence that a conscious self, the soul, can exist separately from the brain, from matter. Uh, such evidence comes, I guess the Apple computer doesn't like what I did on the PC. <clears throat> it comes from medical studies of out-of-body experiences, and you know, we plan to have some personal testimonies about such things. This evidence is consistent with evidence from the Shabda Pramana, which tells us that consciousness is the energy of the soul. The conscious self is never created, never destroyed. Now we can consider the question, where are we? <clears throat> Given that the self is not material, there must be a place where it can express its spiritual nature in full. That is the spiritual world. There, the soul can exist in loving harmony with the supreme soul, God, Krishna, and with all other souls. Why is the soul not in the spiritual world? Some souls have chosen not to love God purely, so where are such souls like us? For such souls, God has manifested the material universes. We are now in one of them. Our universe did not come about, according to the Vedic sources of knowledge, by chance, as many scientists now believe. Our universe and many others were deliberately manifested by God. They've expanded from the form of the Maha Vishnu. Many universes come out, they begin small, they expand according to the Puranas. <clears throat> Some modern scientists also believe that there are many universes and that they start out small and expand. The universes eventually contract and re-enter the body of Mahavishnu. <clears throat> and some modern scientists also believe that universes will eventually contract. Mahavishnu expands into each of the universe and injects souls into the, them by his glance. So that's how we get into a universe. So each universe is thus a virat rupa, a form of God manifest in matter. God makes universes to give souls an alternative reality, alternative to the spiritual world. Uh, just like companies make virtual reality technology to give people alternative realities. I just want to give them one, um, what's the word, taste. One of our first exhibits, we, we call it the morphing wall, where a person enters and sees himself like a mirror reflection. And as he walks down different stations through various facial rec recognition technology and then so on, 
He's going to see his gender change. He's going to see his age go up and down with the same face. And at the end, with this virtual technology um, glass or whatever but visionary thing that is, he's going to see himself in a different species. And by putting those glasses on, he's going to start experiencing like what a family life would be like as an elephant or something like that. It's just going to blow their minds. And this is like the first exhibit on the first level that you're not this body, who are you? It's a very high-tech museum that we're planning. Uh, here's a topic that came up earlier today. Uh, our universe appears designed, finely tuned for life to exist. Uh, at least six physical cons constants are set to very precise numerical values. And if you want to know what they are, you could consult astrophysicists who are here with us today, like Kunal. But uh, they include N, the ratio between the electromagnetic force and gravity, two, the binding energy, three, omega, the ratio between the critical density and the actual density of matter in the universe, lambda, the energy content of empty space, Q, the measure of the force necessary to overcome gravity, six, the number of dimensions in the universe. The Royal Astronomer of the United Kingdom at some point, uh, Sir Martin Rees, wrote in his book, Just Six Numbers, these six numbers constitute a recipe for a universe if any one of them were to be untuned, there would be no stars and no life. Some scientists propose that there are many universes to avoid the conclusion that our universe was deliberately designed by God for life to exist. They say there are many universes with different values for the fundamental constants and we just happen to live in the one where, by chance, the values are right for us to exist. However, they've never observed these other universes. But according to the Shabda Pramana, actually there are many universes and they're all designed for life and are inhabited. Something to consider. In the material universe, souls require material bodies. According to the Puranas, there are 8,400,000 kinds of bodies. These bodies exist to give specific kinds of experiences to souls according to the quality of their desires. The three modes of nature in relation to quality of desire determine acquisition of bodies. The bodies exist in certain locations or lokas, which like the bodies themselves are meant to give conditioned souls different kinds of experience. Just like a, a company, like an airline will design certain classes of travel to give you a certain type of experience in a certain location. Um, so there are earthly locas, material, hellish locas, other locas. The whole system of material bodies and locas is manifested and administered by God's intelligent agents, the demigods. They move souls from body to body, from loka to loka. Let me just jump in one last time here. Sorry. No, that's what you're there for. <laughs> in order to persuade someone to be open-minded to the concept of life beyond Earth, above Earth, throughout the universe, we're going to have an, a series of exhibits. One of them which again, we need a, a, a really good science-minded devotee who knows the history 
of astro astronomical theory in the Western world so that we can present how in the West the theories of the universe and the, and the solar system started in a geocentric way, then went to a heliocentric way, then Copernicus system didn't work with the orbits, and they had to go to Kemp, and he didn't have the right. Every time they've changed their model to solve one problem, they found, well, then there's another problem. So again, this idea of going through the history of modern Western astronomy will be just to show that they don't really have a final, firm theory yet, so please be open-minded. Then we're going to have, before we get to the Puranic universe, fifth canto, and four people just dismiss this, we're going to show the universe according to the Surya Synodic texts, which are somewhat similar to what we see with our sensory perception. And when we show that these texts are so ancient, and yet they describe things that no one could imagine, distances between planets, diameters of planets, and so on. It will give them, again, more faith in these Vedic texts. So then we finally go to this Puranic universe, which describes dimensions of the universe that we can't enter and perceive. We're gonna need a lot of help explaining that in the final stages before we bring them up to the planetarium theater. Uh, again, this collection of material locas is something like virtual reality systems where programmers make bodies for people to interact with virtual worlds the soul is eternal, but the material body is temporary. When one body ends, the soul enters another. There is reincarnation, and there's some scientific evidence for that. For example, the kinds of studies carried out by Ian Stevenson and his other colleagues who've investigated past life memories. In reincarnation, there can be an evolution of the soul through bodies of different species. This is the original Vedic <coughs> concept of evolution. The ultimate destination of the soul is the spiritual world, but to get there, the soul must first understand where it is now, at the present moment. Just like one must understand the airport before one can get to the destination of one's flight. If you don't understand the layout of the airport, you're going to miss your flight. So some parts of the material universe are not, <clears throat> are not visible to ordinary human sense perception, according to the Vedic epistemology. That would include the description of Bhu Mandala given in the fifth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam with elements such as Mount Meru and the ring islands and oceans. <clears throat> but you know, even in modern astronomy, there are things not visible to ordinary human vision. Uh, you know, for example, an astronomer might be looking at a certain area of the sky through an optical telescope and see nothing there, whereas an astronomer using an X-ray telescope can detect uh, a massive source of X-rays at that same location. <clears throat> So understanding the Vedic universe means accepting the existence of invisible forms of matter. And this is also true of the modern scientific view of the universe. According to cosmologists today, only about uh, four or five percent of the universe is composed of visible matter. Uh, it's roughly 30% invisible dark matter and 65% dark energy. So exhibits 
will be made on the unseen features of the Vedic universe, such as the structure of Bhumandala, the heavenly material planets, subterranean heavenly planets, the shells of the universe, the Vaikuntha planets, the spiritual worlds beyond the shells of the material universe. <clears throat> The Vedic universe also has features that are visible to ordinary human sense perception. Some of the Vedic astro astronomical texts, such as the Surya Siddhanta, describe mostly the visible aspects of the Vedic universe according to a geocentric perspective. Other texts like the Srimad Bhagavatam describe both the visible and invisible features of the universe. And there'll be exhibits on both of these. As far as the history of the universe goes, the most important events are the appearances of the avatars of God. They come to remind people who they are and where they are. So we want to have some exhibits about that. To, to, to give the actual purpose of the universe. And these avatars established lines of spiritual teachers, and Srila Prabhupada appeared in one of these lines and founded the International Society for Krishna Consciousness and conceived the Temple of Vedic Planetarium. So on our first level, when people first enter, we're currently planning to have a, an animatronic uh, display of Srila Prabhupada uh, giving people the message that he intends to convey uh, with the temple, the temple of Vedic Planetarium that he envisioned. And this is important because when people have a true understanding of who they are and where they are, they can act cooperatively to satisfy their material needs in the most simple, natural, and efficient way possible while simultaneously making progress to attaining eternal life in the spiritual world. So that's a, a, a brief sketch of the kinds of things that are going to be developed for the three floors of the museum wing of the Temple of Vedic Planetarium and the Planetarium Theater that'll be located on the dome level. So Hare Krishna, thank you. So you may be wondering, how can you participate? How can you help? And tomorrow at Brahmatirthas, we're going to be talking about that in great detail. In the short time I've been here, I'll give you a few examples. I met a devotee who has got a PhD in geology, and I asked him to help us in designing the exhibit for the Varata Rupa. And he's very excited to do that, to, to see how he can participate. For the last few years, I've been searching through our movement to find biologists who can help us explain some of these arguments about irreducible complexity of these machines inside a cell that couldn't have formed in a step-by-step -step, uh, evolutionary uh, manner I don't know if that's still a valid argument, but that's what we need help on. So whatever your field is, it could be this, the uh, philosophy of science or a specific discipline within science, you can contact us. Now, how can they contact us? Um, we don't have a central contact site yet, do we? So I would say for all of you who are here, 
you know how to contact Brahmatiyatha Prabhu, and we are reaching out to the BI for help. So I haven't told him this yet, but he's going to be our point of contact. <laughs> okay. Does anyone have any questions? Thank you very much for that nice presentation. Uh, maybe this is the right place and time or not to discuss this, but one of the points, one of the excellent points that Yogeshwar Prabhu had made some years ago was how do we avoid the public from saying that this is a good Hindu perspective on the universe? And I think maybe on those lines it might be worthwhile for someone to research about what the other so-called religions have to say on the aspects of the universe. Thank you for that suggestion. Hare Krishna. Uh, I have also, I also have a suggestion. There are different opinions amongst devotees which arguments are the best for proving the presence of a, a non-material consciousness or proofs for God or proofs against evolution. So my suggestion is to collect the arguments amongst science-minded devotees, philosopher devotees, and then ask professional opinion about them from non-devotee scientists who are the most expert on the field before we use these arguments on the presentation uh, in the Vedic Planetarium. I, I think it's crucial, it's very important. I want to introduce our art director because there may be some in this audience who are artists and he is the person you should contact. Perhaps our greatest artist, Bhardraj Prabhu. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for this really wonderful presentation. I really like how uh, this was laid out in sort of like an as a spiraling, ascending story that people can walk through from where they are now to uh, where we're hopefully trying to go to. Um, I have a question in the form of a comment, as is usual in these settings. But I heard you, Prabhu, speak when you were speaking about scientific theories. Um, you use a very common phrase that is prevalent in many religious communities who are looking back at science, which is, you said, just a theory. And often we confuse theories with hypotheses. Theories are something that have been developed over decades, if not centuries. And because they take that long to develop, it's inherent in the nature of a scientific theory to change over time. That's part of the process of developing a scientific theory. And in this way, science, which can roughly be equated with Veda, is not Vedanta, which has a conclusion. And we are trying to show the conclusion now of all of this science. So I just wanted to add that as a comment that I wanted to ask a perhaps challenging question, which is, can you please leave some of this work behind for future generations? We do not have, we're stuck here at the Virat Rupa, right? We've been talking about this because we don't, we have not realized this ourselves. And this is something that will take time and may take generations. And it would be a great mercy for you guys and maybe people my age to leave something behind for our children and grandchildren to also continue revealing this knowledge to the world. So my question is, can you please leave some of this behind for future generations? Yeah, I think... Uh... Well, I'm going to say something else, but just in regard to this, I had the idea that one easy way to do that is to make the chandelier a hologram rather than a, you know, solid construction. And, and, um, and uh, <laughs> the question about other religious traditions stimulated me to think, just as in our Vaishnava tradition, Lord Buddha, you know, was incorporated as an incarnation of Vishnu, and Srila Prabhupada also discussed Lord Jesus Christ and Muhammad as pure devotees or as Shakti Abhish avatars. Does the uh, plan include some dioramas maybe of Jesus? Or I think that, would be, that might help a lot if we want to prevent the idea of this being a Hindu uh, presentation only. I think one of the things that distinguishes 
the Temple of Vedic Planetarium is that there are texts, sacred texts, that we believe are thousands and thousands of years old that have descriptions of the origin of life, different species, planets, the whole universe that you don't find in other traditions. So we plan on wowing the public with that, and that is really a wow moment when you, if to hear that, what, there's a theory of, of universal creation and expanding universe that's thousands of years old and not just 100 or 50 years old? I don't know how else to respond to that yet. It's still evolving. But we are centered on the Puranic and Vedic version because it is so amazing and there's nothing like it anywhere in the world. And you're right, it shouldn't be presented as just one of many world religions. So again, the devotee philosophers can help us to make sure we don't present it in the wrong, limited, uh, secular way. Um, I've got a question. Um, it was part of the presentation that um, uh, we, from the knowledge that was gained, we would be able to see ourselves within this world and living a simpler, more natural, efficient way of life. Does that mean that there will be opportunities for engineers and people involved, say, in medicine, the environment, and all aspects of lifestyle to make their contribution for exhibits that will demonstrate the application of the knowledge that has been uh, venerated within the uh, temple? To some extent, I would say yes. Of course, it's mainly intended to be cosmological, but it does have some implications for how things are going to be organized and the extent to which we're able to do that in the space that we have, we'll have to discuss. Of course, you're also <laughs> a member of our executive committee and your views on that will be seriously considered. Let, let, me, let me just reveal one other thing here. Everyone thinks of the TOVP as one monolithic entity, but actually, there's two branches of the TOVP. The principal branch, which you all know is headed by Ambarish Prabhu, is to build the gigantic, gorgeous structure and have the deities moved in by the year 2022. That's the physical, structural, branch of the TOVP. There's a separate branch with separate funding for the exhibits in both the main temple and in the West Wing Planetarium. That separate second branch of the TOVP has already funded a small dome theater. And the topics that you just mentioned are perfect for filming and showing because we need so much material in that dome theater to constantly you know, revolve and not just have one or two movies forever. I have a question about, uh, <clears throat> this is an absolutely fantastic endeavor and what you describe the exhibits and the models and the chandeliers sound very sophisticated. And Mayapur will be visited by people from all walks of life, from the rural community to very international sophisticated people, how will you make all this information easily digestible to people coming from all walks of life? Because to me, it sounds extremely sophisticated right now. I can jump in on that. The main temple and all the exhibits will be for no charge. And the masses will go there. Masses of wonderful people from all over will go there. But for people who want to really understand much more detailed scientific presentations about the Vedic cosmology, there will be an admission charge. And they will be wearing shoes in the planetarium west wing. Uh, another thing I'd like to say 
and this is also for the benefit of the EC members who are here, is that when it gets down to the production of specific exhibits, there will be different teams formed that include different types of people. One of them be specialist in the subject matter to make sure that that goes all right. Then there'll be artists and videographers and others who are expert in design and exhibit making and things like that. But I would envision also having an educator, educators as part of <coughs> each team to make sure that we're communicating our message to the different age groups and intelligence levels that of, of the potential audience that we'll have. So I would say that there would be a role for educators like yourself to play. I just want to mention one last thing which was already said, but I want to leave you with this. In the energy level, the first thing that people will see after they've gotten their admission, this is part of one of his many contributions, they're going to see an audio animatronic figure of Shiva Prabhupada, life size, walking, talking, expressing his invitation to all souls to learn Vedic knowledge and perfect their lives. It's going to be incredible. And that's the opening exhibit when you first arrive. So thank you.